for the rest of the semester. All right. And therefore, please bring any questions that you have to class and or to lab. All right, to, to go over that. Because again, um, it is important that um, whatever loose ends we have with it, whatever you're not understanding, we get clarified. There's one big thing that I want to talk about. Um, I don't know if we'll do it tonight. Probably not. I'll uh, probably do it next time. Um, but um, that is a uh, switchboard. Um, how a switchboard can make, uh, make uh, your application much more user friendly. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that at some point. Um, I have posted uh, weeks 13 through 15, and, and weeks 13 through 15 are probably, for lack of a better word, uh, some advanced concepts. You know, we covered in the first section of class. You know, in a way, this class has four main sections. I don't, I won't say they're equal sections, but four main sections. The first uh, section is just general concepts about databases, what they are, what advantages they offer. The second is about database design, which is, is a very critical uh, one. The third section is about SQL. And this last one is probably, for lack of a better word, uh, advanced concepts. So we will uh, spend some time talking about um, uh, some of these advanced concepts. I have a couple loose ends that I want to talk to about SQL. And I'll just demonstrate uh, a couple of items here. Um, first thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about a form of the insert statement that comes in very handy. I want to look at a, a form of the... Um, I'm sorry, form of the insert statement that comes in handy when you are converting data uh, between two, um, between uh, Excel and, um, and Access. Let's go and make a very simple Excel worksheet and talk about importing it in Access. And we'll at least talk about uh, what you would do um, to do this. And keeping in the theme that we had before, I'm going to go into Excel and make a little worksheet that would have um, student and faculty information, similar to what we've been doing all along. So we could do something like this. Student name, we'll put in this column, or rather student number. Uh, student first name, st student last name, faculty number, faculty first name, and faculty last name. Now, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to make a couple errors on purpose. All right. Let's put in student 100, Sam, Jones. Their faculty member, let's say, is 1,000. One, 1, and Mike. Zellers, let's go and put faculty, two, or student 200, Sue Smith, uh, faculty member, also 1,000, Mike Zellers, student number 300, um, Mark Davis. And we'll say faculty number 1,000 is Paul Morad. In other words, that's a mistake, right? Because me and Paul can't both be faculty number 1,000. And finally, I'm going to put in 400. Um, and I'll put in Paul. 
Paul with his real faculty ID number. Now, we know that this is not normalized, right? Because again, it has, it, it combines two things. It combines faculty information and student information. So we know that it's really not, you know, this, this data is not normalized. So, oftentimes what happens is a small project someone will do in Excel, all right? And after that project sort of reaches a critical mass, people start to see the limitations of Excel and people start to see the benefits of relational databases. So oftentimes then at that point, people want to convert the data from Excel into uh, Access. Now I'll show you some of the tricks that I've done with this and this will be a good review of some of the SQL statements. So what I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to save this and I'll save it on the desktop. And I'll call it school. Save. Then I'm going to go into Access and create a database also called school on the desktop. Now what I'm going to go into is I'm going to go up to external data. And what we can do is we can import from Excel. All right. Now here's the, here's the methodology I'm going to apply. Me knowing that the data is coming from Excel, I know that there's likely going to be problems with the data. Right? The whole thing about um, Excel worksheets and, and sequential files is that they lend themselves to errors. They lend themselves to redundant data, duplicate data, um, inconsistent data, and so on. So we have a couple, we have, we have one error I think in, in, in our database, uh, in our Excel worksheet rather, the, the fact that there's two uh, instructor number 1000s. All right, and, and we'll, we'll uh, take care of that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to import that, that Excel worksheet into a table in Access that looks just like the Excel worksheet. In other words, it's going to have the same columns, the same everything. All right? And then I'm going to create the tables that I want, and then I'm going to use insert statements from a select statement to populate the tables. So I'm going to go, oh, I was in the right place. Import Excel, and I'm going to browse, and I'm going to find that school worksheet and I have some choices. I can link it to Excel so that Access and Excel will sort of share the same data and talk to each other. That way I could still use Excel. That's not what I'm talking about doing here. I don't have any tables in here so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to create a new table. So I'm going to click OK. Alright. It shows me then the data that it wants to import. All right, and it shows me on sheet one I have that data. I'll click next. Now it's guessing, and you know, it's guessing that the the first row is column headings, which is correct, right? The first row, for example, in this table is student uh, number, and that that isn't a piece of data, you know, that is the description of that column. So it guessed right on that. So we can leave that checked and click Next. It's now going to go in and let us field by field say what we want to do. So the student number, yeah, we want to call it student number. Do we want it indexed? No. What type is it? It's guessing it's a double and so on. As it turns out, with data this simple, it's going to be pretty straightforward. All right. Now, I'm going to not add a primary key to this. This is going to be one of the rare instances where I'm not going to add a primary tea, uh, key. Why? Because this table isn't where the, this data is going to permanently live in Access. I'm going to take data from this table and populate other tables, populate the real tables that I want. So I'm going to go and click Next. Give me a table name. I'm going to call this raw Excel data. 
and I'll click finish and now I have a table called raw Excel data that contains an Excel ta uh, uh, table that matches up with the data in my, my worksheet. All right? So I've gotten it into Access, but I haven't gotten it in the form in Access that I want it because I obviously don't want this table to be my real table in Access. Right? Um, I want, uh, I want uh, this to be broken down into a faculty table and uh, a student table. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create the two tables that I actually do want. All right, I'm going to create my faculty table and student table. And then I'm going to populate it. So, let me go in. Um, create table. Design view student. Because I've already had the student numbers assigned, I'm not going to make it an auto number. I'm just going to make it a number. Student first name. Student last name. And finally, faculty number. which will be a number. All right. Go and save that. I'm now going to go in and create a table called faculty. And I'll call this faculty number, which is a number. I'll call faculty first name, text, faculty last name, and text. Now, one thing I'm not going to do, which you might think is odd, is I'm not going to create the relationships between those tables. At least not yet. Why am I not creating the relationships between those tables? I want to clean up the data, right? There might be some scrubbing I have to do of the data. So therefore, that raw data that comes from Excel, you know, part of the problem with Excel data is the fact that, hey, you're, uh, you're apt to have some, some bad data. So therefore, I'm not going to create that relationship right off. I'm going to wait after I've cleaned up the data, and then I'm going to, uh, then I can create the relationship. All right, so now, I'm going to use a special syntax of the um, insert statement. Let me go in design view and fix these column names for this table. Remove the spaces because I don't like to have spaces in the column names. If you remember from last time, I said that the main form of the insert that you use looks something like this. Insert into, and then the table name, so in this case student, and I can specify the columns, student number, um, student first name, student last name, and faculty number. And then normally I'd specify the values and I could put in the student number for the first, you know, first student, student 100 is Bill. Miller, and their faculty advisor has an ID of 1,000, let's say. So normally I could do that. But now I want to I insert a bunch of students, right? All at once. What students do I want to insert? I want to insert all of them that are in this raw table, raw Excel data. 
So what I would like to be able to do is select these four columns from this table and use that data to insert into this table. So the statement to select those four columns looks something like this. I'm going to go into Query Design, SQL View, and I'll say select student number, student first name, student last name, faculty number from raw Excel data. Oh, I spelled student number wrong. Remember, if you ever get that box appearing, it's expecting a parameter, which means that you got one of the column names wrong. So student number, still got it wrong. Okay, let's go. Student umber. <laughs> All right. Now if we go and run this query, we get a list of those. I want to use those as the value into my insert statement. So I can actually say this. I can say, I want to insert into that, and I want to select student number, student first name, student last name, faculty number from raw Excel data. So I can actually specify with a query the values that this insert is going to use. So let's go and execute this. And it's telling me I'm about to append four rows. I click yes, and there they are. They're now in the student table. All right. Now, I stack the deck. I know there's a problem with the faculty table. What I could do is this. I could look to see if there are, if there's an invalid combination of faculty number, faculty name, and faculty last name. And I could do it this way. I could make a query that says select. faculty number, faculty first name, faculty last name, count from raw Excel data, group by What should the count be for every faculty person? One, right? There should only be one faculty person that has a combination of, um, actually, let's do this. Let's see if there's any duplicate. I was looking for something else. Let's see if there's any duplicate um, faculty numbers in here. And the count for each faculty person should be um, one. Right? There should only be one faculty person in there with that faculty ID. Actually, no. I know what I want to do. I was, I was right the first time. Actually, there's probably several ways I could do it. But if I run this query, I'm going to see that 
faculty number 1000 exists under two names, two different names. So I'll see faculty 100, or I'm sorry, 1000 in there twice. So I know it's bad data and I know I can clean it up. All right. Again, there's any number of queries that you could run to do this. Um, you could, you know, you could go and, and uh, again, look for uh, any number of different conditions to see if there's any duplicate um, names or IDs or anything like that. Again, we're not going to solve any of your problem. The point is, we're not going to solve all your problems, rather. The point is, is we can use queries to look at the data and see if it's bad or not. The last step we can do is, if we want to insert into the faculty, That'll give us a list of faculty members. And we can say insert into faculty and select those four columns. Now, this guy give me an error. All right. Let's see if we can tell why it's going to give me an error. I can do that insert, and I'm selecting the values from there. I run it. faculty number in there twice. All right. So now when I run it, I'm about to append four rows. I click yes. It gives me an error and it blows up. Why do you suppose it blows up? Well, it blows up because it's trying to insert me in there twice, right? I have two students that I advise, so it's trying to insert me in the table twice. So it gets a duplicate key the second time around. What could I do to make sure that this doesn't return every instance of faculty, but only returns one instance? I could do the distinct. Now this is still going to give us an error. About to append three rows. And it gives me the error because I didn't go out and fix Norod's faculty number. It tried to insert him, it tried to insert a second row 1000. Now notice as I said before, if you look, there's nothing in the faculty table. All right? These SQL statements either succeed to, uh, completely or fail completely. So because it got that one error, it didn't insert anything. So now, what I can do to kind of finish this off is go in here and clean up that NORAD number and give it the proper number and then run this query and there you go. I had to close out of it and open it back up again to show the data. And now they're in there properly. Now, I can go and make those relationships. And everything should go okay. And I can probably delete that raw Excel data table. So to summarize this, again, I, I can't possibly discuss every single case, but I can discuss some general principles. Um, Number one, you import your Excel data into a table that looks just like the Excel data. That was the first step I did. And I didn't put any primary keys on it. It's just sort of a duplicate of the Excel table. I then create my regular tables, but I do not um, enforce relationships yet because I want to clean up the data first. All right. 
I then use an insert statement and get the values from a select to populate my real tables from the raw Excel data. All right. Lastly, I run queries to look for problem data. In, in our case, we had duplicate, we had two instructors that both were listed as having instructor ID 1000. But there could be a lot of different errors, right? There could be, um, you know, student, uh, students with non-existent faculty members or no faculty advisor or whatever. But you can run queries to find those. And then once you find them, you can correct the data and then you can go and run the insert and populate the data. Um, this is a valuable skill. I've had to do this a number of times and I don't see a problem like this going away because again, typically the life, life cycle of a, of a small application will go that someone will do something with it in Excel, then at some point they start running into the limitations and therefore they want to do uh, convert it to a relational database. Okay. All right, so that's the insert from the select. Again, you don't normally do that, but when you have cause to do it, it can be very, very, very effective. Um, couple other things. Views. They talk in the textbook about uh, view uh, equivalent queries or query equivalent view. No, view equivalent queries. All right. Really what a view is, is it's sort of a query that you save. In other words, your data isn't stored that way, but you typically or oftentimes want to view it that way. All right? So, for example, I could create a view or a query in Access that looks exactly like my spreadsheet. All right? That's, that's again, something that people often say. Well. I don't understand why you break it down into separate tables because I want to see the faculty name next to the student name on my list. Okay, that's fine. You can do that and you can do that in a query. And once you create a query for it, you can save that query and use it really anywhere that you'd use a table. So I could go in and I could create a query from these two tables. And I could have the query look exactly like my spreadsheet looked. So I can go and run this. Looks exactly like my spreadsheet. I can go and save it. And in Access, these are known in queries, but in other database systems, they're known as views. I just realized now I didn't have the computer screen on. All I really did was go into uh, and create a query that pulled all the fields from the student and faculty table. And when you run it, you get that. Now that I've created that view, I can treat it like a table, except I can't add and, and change it. But I could go and I could write a report off of that. Or I could create a form off of that. So I could go here and create from that a form. And it will show me a view that will show all the data from those tables combined. Now, I can't add anything to it because again, a view is a read-only thing. A query or view is read-only. So I can use it to combine data, but I can't use it to um, uh, to, to add data to either table. Access would get confused if I was adding data, which table to maintain, do I maintain both of them, do I just maintain one of them, so you, you don't maintain any of them. I can then run actually a query off of this query. So I could go and create a query from my query to maybe filter out and only show those people who are advised by Zellers. All right. I didn't want to do that. Let's go back to query design. There. Show me everything where the ID equals Zellers or where the name equals Zellers. 
Or if I want to get clever, I can add a parameter here and go up here and say add a parameter for enter name, which is text. And then I can say give me faculty where the faculty advisor's name equals whatever I've entered in the parameter. And then when I run this, I can type in either name and it will show me the students that, that they advise. So the bottom line is for querying or for reporting or for making forms, a query acts just like a table. In fact, oftentimes what you do as a database designer is you'll give your users a number of views where the tables are sort of pre-joined together and they can write very simple queries. The complicated part of queries typically is joining all the tables together. All right, joining this table with that table with that table with that table. QBE on a single table is pretty straightforward. All right, and even people that aren't really experts in databases can do that. So what often you'll do is you'll give them a query that joins all the tables together. Then they can write queries off of that query to go and filter out only the data that they need. Um, one thing that we will do um, throughout the rest of the semester as well is talk about um, enhancements um, or additional features that exist in databases other than Access. Access is a pretty uh, bare-boned um, database. You know, it's meant for you know personal use, use on small projects. It's really not sort of an industrial strength database. And there's a couple of uh, Actually, there's, there's a lot of features that exist in other databases that don't exist in Access. So one of the things we'll be doing over the last few classes is exploring some of those features. The first two I want to talk about are stored procedures and triggers. All right. A stored procedure, and the two sort of go together. All right. A stored procedure is a set of SQL statements that you can combine and put it in a file that contains, again, a list of SQL statements. Let me give you an example. All right. And someone was, someone stole my paper, so let me go and run and grab some paper. I'll be back in a second. Sure thing. Any, anything else anyone need? All right, let's say I have an online application, an online shopping application. And there might be two sets of tables in my online shopping application that sort of match up with each other. All right, there might be my shopping cart table. And we'll call this my shopping cart items. And that may have a relationship to the customer. And it might have a relationship to the item. Let me redraw this. I use the old fashioned symbol for a flat file there by mistake. Here's our shopping cart items. So as I go through and I'm shopping, I click on this item, it gets added to this table. It gets added to the shopping cart table. And it gets added for me, right? Because it's my shopping cart. I've logged on, it gets added to me. 
This also relates to the item table. Right? Because I'm putting in a specific item in the item table. Now, when I go and place an order, when I'm all done and I place the order, what has to happen? Well, there might be an order table and an order item table. When I place an order, I might want to take all the items that I'm ordering out of my shopping cart, delete them from there, and insert them into the order item table. All right. So I go in, I put 10 items in my shopping cart, all right, and then I decide I want to buy them. So I go and click, you know, order, place order or, or finish order or whatever you call it. At that point, I want to do a couple different things. I want to delete them from this table and insert them into this table. Well, that's two SQL statements, right? That's two operations that I want to perform. I want to delete everything in my shopping cart and I want to create an order, uh, a row in the order table, and I want to create an order item row for every item that was in my shopping cart. So that's probably like, you know, three, four SQL statements. But I want to do all of them, right? I could create a stored procedure to do that. That would do all the things necessary. That is, it would create a row in the order table for this customer. It would go and copy all the order items from the shopping cart into the order item table and then it could delete those out of that. So it could do those, all three of those operations that could be combined into one stored procedure. And that way, when an order is placed, instead of each programmer having to code the whole process, that stored procedure can run, it runs, typically stored procedures run quickly, and they can be used to update and do everything that you need to do when an order gets placed. All right? Maybe even do something with the inventory of that item, check the inventory, uh, whatever. All right. The bottom line is those SQL statements, all the SQL statements we've been doing in this class have been individual SQL statements. You, however, can take and combine SQL statements to form a little program of SQL statements, and that's a stored procedure. Now, Access does not support stored procedures, but other larger databases do. All right. The other thing that other databases don't uh, support that Access doesn't is a trigger. Now let's consider a couple different possibilities for triggers. One might be something like this. A trigger is when it is a trigger is code that gets executed when certain operations are performed on a table. For example, if an employee is deleted from the employee database, that's the delete, that is a deletion from the employee table. I can write a trigger that, ha that occurs, that gets executed, whenever someone is deleted from the employee table. Maybe, for example, we log who did it, the name of the person that did the deletion. Or maybe we take the employee out of the employee table and put them in the retired employee table. Or any number of different things that we do, we might do, uh, every time we want to uh, delete an employee. So with a trigger, you can take the three main things that you can do to a database table, insert, update, and delete, and write special code to go and execute when those occurrences happen. And oftentimes, that code is a stored procedure. So that's why triggers and stored procedures go together. Let me give you a, a, a for instance. Uh, one of the things that we talked about in 
uh, database design is we talked about denormalizing a table. All right. And what's denormalizing? Well, denormalizing is what happens when you try to normalize your tables, but you find that with all that data, it's very hard to get the performance that you need. For example, I think we, look like, we looked at um, an example like this. Really, we don't want to keep the customer year-to-date purchases in the customer table, right? Why not? Because we can always add them up from the order item table. We can go and we can compute how many particular items that, that the customer purchased and how much they spent and all that, simply by summing up all the order items for all the orders for that customer. Well, in a very large database, um, that could be a, a, a massive undertaking to do. All right? uh, massive in terms of there can be a lot of different rows in all these tables and summing up, even with different indexes that we create and, and other things, summing up the number of orders uh, and the dollar value of those orders that a customer placed this year could actually take a long time to do. And if it takes too long, if we're not getting the performance we need, we might back up and say, we're going to denormalize this database. Now again, I think I mentioned, you don't denormalize just because you don't feel like normalizing. You denormalize because you've tried to normalize it and you found the performance isn't good, isn't up to what it needs to be. And then you go in and do something like, hey, I'm going to put the customer's year-to-date purchases in the customer table. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, there's two things now that need to be updated every time an order is placed or changed or deleted. So, in other words, if I order another $500 worth of goods, not only do I have to put it in the order item table, I have to go and update that as well. So, there's two things that have to happen. That's a form of redundant data. The risk of that, of course, is that it could get out of sync. If I updated one and not the other, then the total of their order items isn't going to match their year-to-date purchases, which isn't good. You'll have inaccurate data because the data is duplicated. Now, where do triggers and stored procedures come into play? Triggers can be used to keep this duplicated data, this denormalized data, in sync. Something like this. There would be an insert trigger on the order item table. Every time a row was inserted in the order item table, the dollar amount of that order item should be added to the customer's year-to-date purchases. So every time a row gets inserted here, whatever the dollar amount of that order item is, will get added to the customer's year-to-date purchases. And that would be done by a trigger. If it's done by a trigger, it doesn't matter which program enters it in. You know, there might be orders placed by website. There might be orders placed by phone orders. And maybe different programs process those orders. All right. If that trigger exists on the database level, then any way that um, data gets into that table, the customer's year-to-date purchases will get updated as well. So we'd have an insert trigger to keep track of inserts. We'd have a delete trigger so that when an order item was deleted, if someone canceled an order and deleted or deleted an item off of the order, it would take whatever the dollar amount was for that and subtract it out of the customer's year-to-date purchases. And then finally, there would be an update trigger that whenever this row was updated, whatever the difference was between the original amount and the new amount would either get added or subtracted from the customer's year-to-date total. So, that sort of takes some of the sting out of denormalizing your database. Right? Because the risk with denormalizing your database is that these two things could get out of sync. If you build triggers 
that gives you a fighting chance that that uh, data will stay in sync, all right, and, and will match up. Because again, it's not, you, you know, you're not uh, restricted to having every programmer have to get it right, all right. Um, if the trigger is defined correctly, then it will keep those things in sync. Now, those last two things I talked about, again, just to be sure we understand, are not a part of access. They're part of other larger, more industrial strength databases. Uh, one of the things that you have to do for the last assignment is go and write uh, a brief comparison of Access and, and SQL Server. So you'll explore the SQL Server database and see what some of the features it has that Access does not have. All right. That's all for tonight. Um, over the next, again, two weeks roughly, yeah, four classes left, right? Because we have Thursday this week. We have just Tuesday the week after, right? Because of Thanksgiving. And then we have Tuesday and Thursday the following week, I think. All right? So there's four more classes. We'll be looking at chapters six through eight. And I have posted a summary of what about those chapters are important and what about those chapters we're going to cover. So we'll, we'll kind of stick to that. Um, because again, there's a whole lot of stuff in, in those, but we'll, we'll focus on the stuff that, that's really most important for this class. All right, we'll see you in lab.